On the 22nd of February 1943, three young adults were executed by a guillotine for the crime of high treason against the Nazi state. Such executions were commonplace, but the story of these three people still resonate to this day. Hans Scholl and Christoph Kotz, both 24 years old, and Sophie Scholl, 21 years old. The three were anti-war protesters who fought against the Nazi state, and part of a movement called the White Rose. Sophie in particular is remembered for her bravery in the face of authoritarian control, and in the face of certain death. They ultimately paid for their defiance with their lives, and in today's video, we will cover the actions of these people, and how they came to meet such a grisly end. Sophie and Hans Scholl were siblings, two of six children, born to Magdalena and Robert Scholl. Magdalena had met Robert when they both served as medical orderlies during World War I. Robert had refused to join the army as a pacifist. They raised their family in the town of Forstenberg, where Robert would later become mayor. In 1932, the family moved to the city of Ulm, and it's there where they witnessed the rise of the National Socialists. The six siblings were excited by the prospect of the Hitler Youth and the League for German Girls program. Their parents were generally opposed to National Socialism, and were disappointed that their children seemed to be embracing the new government. Robert attempted to point out to his children that all of Hitler's programs were building towards war, whether that would be to expand the armament factories and armed forces, or creating infrastructure to assist in a future war effort. This fell largely on young and rebellious ears, eager to embrace the new opportunities presented by the Nazi youth programs. These youth programs were designed to install into German youth the ideals for the ideal Nazi citizen. Hitler had made it very clear in his early writings that whoever had the youth had the future of a nation. The Hitler Youth had a strong militaristic focus placed on the activities. In addition to encouraging physical fitness and comradeship, the boys were taught to march and to shoot. Once the children became full members, they were presented with a dagger with the words blood and honour engraved into the blade. For the girls of the League of German Girls, the focus was on preparing the members for motherhood and homely duties. And both groups promoted the Nazi racial ideologies. They also encouraged their members to be prepared to report any anti-Nazi sentiment, especially if it were to come from their parents. Sophie initially thrived at the League, becoming a group leader and a well-regarded member, and Hans likewise rose to a leadership position within the Hitler Youth, and was chosen to be a flag bearer at the 1936 Nuremberg Rally. But this did not stop the growing disillusionment with the Nazi party. Under Nazi law, certain works by Jewish, black or left-leaning artists were designated as degenerate and banned. Following the ban of certain songs and books, soon Jewish classmates were forced out of school. In response, the siblings joined alternative youth programs that were not endorsed by the state. These groups were much freer than those they had to attend. Sophie became increasingly aware that her belief in the Nazi youth groups were not a form of liberation, but rather a force to encourage conformity. One example of this can be seen during an artistic discussion. Sophie recommended they read poems by Heinrich Hein, a 19th century writer and poet. The group leader was disgusted and reprimanded Sophie, stating that Heinrich was nothing but an anti-war left-wing Jewish writer. In addition, in 1933, Hein's books were burned and banned by the propaganda minister Josef Goebbels, as part of the suppression of so-called degenerate and un-German art. In 1937, Hans was conscripted into a cavalry regiment of the German army. It was during this time that Hans and Sophie were arrested, along with two of the siblings, Inge and Werner, for taking part in youth activities outside the Nazi program. The Scholl home was ransacked by the Gestapo, who took the group's writings, diaries and books, looking for degenerate material. As Sophie was only 16, she was shortly after released as were Inge and Werner, but Hans was detained for a month, only being released when his commanding officer was able to successfully vouch for his character and competence as a soldier. 
This, however, did not deter the siblings from continuing down the path of resistance. Sophie, meanwhile, became a somewhat rebellious student at school. This was likely triggered by one of her teachers being sacked for not submitting to Nazism. On multiple occasions, Sophie upset her teachers with her frank remarks that were in stark contrast to Nazi ideology. On more than one occasion, she was sent to the principal and warned that unless her behaviour changed, she would be prevented from sitting her university entrance exams, and reminded that before she could even attend university, she would need to take part in some form of work for the Nazi state. Hans would go on to study medicine at the University of Munich in March of 1939, having previously performed work details building roads and had completed his conscription. It was at university that he would meet other like-minded students who were opposed to Nazism. During the next few years, he would meet the likes of Christoph, Will I Garf, and Alexander Schmorl. These would go on to be the core members of what would become the White Rose Group. These young men would discuss the state of Germany and were secretly opposed to the Nazi regime. They would debate classical philosophy and religious teachings in a bid to form an opposition to the Nazis. The year of 1940 brought very different roles for the siblings. Hans was sent to the Western Front as a medical orderly, whereas after leaving school in 1940, Sophie became a kindergarten teacher. Hans was able to continue his studies in April of 1941. He joined the student company of the Army Medical Squadron in Munich, and it was here where he met Alexander. In 1941, Sophie passed her university entrance exams and hoped she would be able to study with her brother at the University of Munich. However, she still had to serve at least six months in the National Labour Service before being allowed to attend university. Sophie became a nursery teacher, an experience she hated. Sophie enjoyed working with the children, but believed that her work was indirectly perpetuating the war that she condemned. In 1942, Sophie would follow her brother to the University of Munich to study biology and philosophy. Meanwhile, Sophie continued the tradition of pacifism. Sophie's boyfriend was a soldier in the German army, and she would discuss the role of the state and whether the war was just. In one letter she wrote, I can't understand how some people continuously risk other people's lives. I will never understand it, and I think it's terrible. Don't tell me, it's for the fatherland. Her boyfriend Fritz would eventually be sent to Stalingrad, the site of some of the harshest fighting in the war. In his letters, he too would write of the murder of Jewish people on the Eastern Front. It was Fritz who would support the movement by giving Sophie 1,000 Reichsmarks to be put towards a good purpose. Although, Fritz did issue a warning that any resistance would cost Sophie her head and her neck. Hans, Sophie, and the like-minded friends met a professor named Kurt Huber with similar views to them. Kurt was Sophie's philosophy lecturer, but Hans and the medical students would also attend his lectures. These lectures often contained thinly veiled critiques of the Nazi regime. Secret discussions between the students and Huber were the catalyst that resulted the formation of the White Rose Group. In June and July of 1942, the first four White Rose leaflets were produced and distributed. The group had been inspired by similar protests, such as the sermons of Clemens Gallen being copied and distributed in opposition to the T4 involuntary euthanasia program. We have a video covering this topic if you would like to learn more about this. The group had been able to obtain a typewriter using the money sent by Fritz that had not been registered by the Gestapo. More importantly, they were able to purchase a replicating machine. It is important to note just how dangerous it would be to merely purchase thousands of sheets of paper, stamps and envelopes. Such purchases could be monitored by the Gestapo, who would be eager to shut down any unauthorised publications, or face being reported by shopkeepers eager not to be drawn into any investigations or arrests. The group would avoid suspicion by purchasing small amounts of material from many places. The leaflets were then posted all over Munich and left for the university students to collect. Many of the leaflets would be handed into the Gestapo by ordinary citizens. Most of the leaflets were received by academics, civil servants and small business owners. The fact that a number of leaflets were left at the university 
led the Gestapo to believe that those responsible were students. The leaflets would attempt to encourage the German people to rise up against the Nazi state in the hope the war could be brought to an end as soon as possible, with the Nazi government defeated. They spoke of the war crimes committed by the Nazis and in the second leaflet detailed the murder of Jews killed by Waffen SS soldiers on the Eastern Front. The third leaflet was sent to Kurt Huber, who was asked to join the White Rose movement, though ultimately he refused to be any part of it. This was due to the third leaflet, which stated that it was more important for Germany to lose the war than defeat the Soviet Union. To the anti-communist Huber, this was just not something he could get behind. Whilst never a member per se, he would still provide guidance and assist in drafting leaflets from time to time. The fourth leaflet detailed the countless German soldiers who had died as part of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Though soon enough, some members of the White Rose would find themselves on the Eastern Front as well. From the end of July to the end of October 1942, Hans, Alexander and Willi were sent to the Eastern Front on a front internship. And there, they would experience firsthand the massacres of Jewish people, committed by the SS Einstagsgruppen, mobile killing squads operating behind the front lines who would target Jews, Romani and other deemed undesirables. They had seen their fair share of dire situations for the average German soldier firsthand, and this only reaffirmed their belief that the war was futile and must be ended as soon as possible. It was the fifth leaflet that really caught the attention of the Gestapo. It called upon the German people to realize they too could suffer the same fates as the Jews in Russia, and to distance themselves from the Nazi state. It spoke of a future Germany free of national socialism, in a passage that read, The coming Germany must be federalistic. The working class must be liberated from its degraded conditions of slavery by a reasonable form of socialism. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the protection of individual citizens from the arbitrary will of the criminal regimes of violence. These will be the basis of the new Europe. The leaflet made its way around Germany, with the Gestapo believing those distributing the leaflets were both very capable and with substantial resources. Robert Moore, an experienced investigator, was dispatched to track down the movement and deal with those responsible. As it was suspected that the leaflets were being produced by students, the Nazi political leader in Munich, Paul Geisler, addressed the students at the Munich University. He warned them of the consequences of not conforming to Nazi beliefs. But what caused the biggest reaction with Sophie and her fellow female students was when Paul stated that women would be better off giving birth than being at university. This comment sparked outrage with the female students, who stood up and rebuked Geisler. When he ordered his SS guards to start arresting the students, many more stepped in and fought back. This soon became a full-on riot that lasted for three weeks. The White Rose groups believed there to be a link between Geisler's comments and the students' response. They believed that their protests were reaching people and that there were plenty more willing to stand up against the Nazi state. On the 18th of February 1943, Hans and Sophie arrived at the university with a suitcase containing 1,300 leaflets. Some were left in the corridors of the university, lying in wait for the students about to finish their lectures. The rest were taken up to the top floor and dropped down the stairwell and out of the windows into the courtyard below. As they did this, the janitor spotted the pair, and he was a former member of the paramilitary SA and a Nazi member. The janitor confronted Sophie and Hans and detained them until they were taken away by the Gestapo. Christoph would soon join the siblings as evidence was found that he had written part of the leaflet. The siblings initially denied any involvement, but evidence was discovered of draft leaflets in their rooms. In a bid to avoid any other members being arrested, Sophie and Hans both stated they were the only ones involved. Hans attempted to protect his sister by saying that she was not involved. Robert Moore, who had been interrogating Sophie, offered her a way to avoid the death penalty by turning on her brother and saying that she was led astray and under his control. Sophie refused. She was quoted as saying, whatever punishment would be dealt to Hans, she would gladly accept. Sophie never gave any details about any other members of the group. 
All three were charged with high treason and faced trial on the 22nd of February 1943 before the infamous judge Ronald Friesler. Robert and Magdalena Scholl managed to get to the trial of their children, but at the end of the trial they were forcibly removed. Thankfully, Sophie and Hans were able to see their parents before being taken away. Hans stood upright and bid farewell to his parents in a stoic manner, clasping his parents' hands. Sophie bid farewell to her mother, who lamented she would never see her again. But Sophie reassured her mother, saying she had only missed a few years and that she was proud to have taken full responsibility. Sophie, Hans and Christoph were all executed on the same day of their trial only a few hours after being found guilty in a show trial. Unfortunately, further trials of the members of the White Rose movement followed, many being sentenced to prison in a second trial on the 19th of April 1943. Will I. Graf, Kurt Huber and Alexander Schmarell were all sentenced to death for their roles too. As for the legacy of Sophie Scholl and the White Rose movement, the deaths of the leading members and imprisonment of many others did not mean the end for their message. Copies of the leaflets were smuggled out of Germany to the United Kingdom. In July of 1943, the leaflets were dropped from RAF bombers in a bid to encourage the German people to rise up. Whilst it did not have the desired effect, the story of Sophie Scholl is taught to many in Germany about the importance of individual resistance and standing up for what you believe in, even in the face of massive state oppression. This is a theme that permeates through with the new German constitution in a bid to avoid a repeat of the crimes of Nazi Germany. We will end this video with Sophie Scholl's last known words, spoken to her cellmate before she was killed. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? It is such a splendid sunny day and I have to go. But how many have to die on the battlefield these days? How many young promising lives? What does my death matter if by our acts thousands are warned and alerted?